YouTube, and then I'm going to try okay. to share that to the Facebook group. Okay. Now I'm a little box on the top corner. Is it going to split us or how does it work? Yeah, it's split on mine. So I've got, okay. we're side by side. So, okay, okay so we're see. live. Right. Let me check. Okay, so we're live on YouTube. I'm going to go ahead and share this okay. to the group. Awesome. I'm going to try to get it up on my end so I can see the questions coming in. Oh, shoot, hold on. I'm going to have to me mute this because I'm getting two audio tracks. <laughs> Okay, oh, good. So I'm about to share it to the group. Okay. Hey, guys. Oh, there's already people in here. All right, good. Okay, perfect. So I can see the chat. Okay. You can see the chat. Awesome. Let me click. All right. <laughs> there we go. Okay. It's going to be a little weird because the video yeah, this is, is a little behind. It is. It is. Yeah. I feel like yeah. that's pretty typical too. That's on when oh, I yeah, was definitely. on YouTube. Too, it was kind of, it was behind. Here, let me see if I can refresh this and pull up two different ones so I can actually see questions on both sides. Yes. <clears throat> All right. And you guys can start sending in questions whenever you want to just start throwing it at us. We're just going to basically go through and answer as many as we can. Yeah, this will be great. And again, yeah, thank you for doing this. I mean, we've been talking about this for a little while. This is actually the first time we're meeting like kind of face to face. We've talked actually, actually meeting. Chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this and is I was awesome. The same thing. Yeah. So for my channel and your channel, I, I'm sure we've got a couple crossover people who uh, don't know about you or me. Uh, so for my channel, <clears throat> I know I've shouted you out a couple times, but I uh, tell people who you are, uh, kind of what you do and how long you've been doing this. Yeah. Um, so my name is Erica. I have a channel called Memory Box Candle Co. And I kind of started just from the beginning of uh, learning how to make candles. I've just been kind of documenting my process on it. Um, I've been really making candles since September of 2019. I kind of did a little crafts before that, um, just like for uh, Christmas gifts and stuff like the year before. Um, but I mainly just uh, have been really just documenting my process since then. And yeah, I have my candle business. I opened up back in March of this year. Um, so I'm a lot newer than Jeff is. Jeff is definitely a lot more uh, experienced than I am. <laughs> Well, and I've, I've seen you pop up. You've been in the group for a while and I, like, I commend you on your growth. It's been incredible. I love it. Um, especially with like the candles Thank in the you. group and the YouTube channel. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, absolutely love it. And on my side, just in case there's a, uh, some people out there <clears throat> that may not know me, uh, I'm Jeff Stanley. So I think it's been What's that? I had looked up trying to find a group, uh, after, um, I had looked up trying to find a group, like a Facebook group. Um, right after I started making candles. So oh, okay. I've yeah. really kind of got hand in hand of being in the group and making candles. At the no, same that's time. great. That's the way to do it too. Yeah. So my name is Jeff Stanley. I've been doing candles for, I think going on six years now. And uh, just like Erica, I just started getting into this. Uh, I saw some stuff out there, wanted to kind of document my process. And uh, I'd say probably the biggest thing for me starting my channel was at the time, there just wasn't that much out there. And uh, some of the videos that I was following in the beginning, and there were maybe two or three like good videos uh, that actually kind of showed some of the process. But uh, I was talking in the uh, online business course that we we're doing this morning. And uh, one of the reasons I started to do my videos was I just saw kind of a, a lack of uh, content in the arena of candles, basically. And uh, some of the videos I was watching as I started to make candles I just, I realized that there was a lot more to it that they really weren't covering. And uh, so I jumped in there with my daughter, started making some stuff and just kind of grew it from there. And yeah, I know, this I know. you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, yeah, definitely doing it for a little while now. And I was gonna say, that's one of the good things about your channel jumping up. And it's one of the things we've talked about in chat is um, a lot of people ask and kind of we talked about it in the beginning too like kind of overlapping content but i don't think there's any overlap at all and you and i've talked about this a couple times where 
two people can say the exact same thing and it comes across very different to very different people. So like the amount of content out there, uh, yeah. It, it, what do they say? The more ships in uh, like rises the water. I don't know what the saying is, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just the more rises people that are tides. coming on making, yeah, more people that are coming on and, and making more videos, people Absolutely. might, people might learn more from somebody else than they would maybe from me or you, somebody else new could come on and they could like, their teaching style better on how they're explaining things. So, absolutely, absolutely. you know, the more people that come on, the more people learn. Yeah, exactly. And I've told you this before too. That's why I like your content so much is even though we do cover similar topics, we cover them in such different ways that they just speak to different people and, uh, and people have different learning styles, different teaching styles. And I think that's one of the kind of the beautiful parts about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's see. Sorry. And I apologize. I'm looking down on my phone because that's kind of where I'm reading the chat. So that's why I'm looking off to the side. Um, no, I'm doing the same thing. I've got see. my PC yeah. off to the side. <laughs> so what's your, I was looking let's through your, uh, yeah. I like your background with all the jars and everything like that. What's your favorite scent you do? Oh gosh. When I do all my um, testing, I do, I do cinnamon. I love cinnamon. So I do all my testing with cinnamon. What's your kind of go-to? See, I am not a cinnamon person. I yeah. actually, yeah, I know you've always said that you, you use um, cinnamon for testing. I always recommend like a Fruit Loops or like a mango and coconut milk for testing one. because they're very strong scents. Yeah. Um, so you know that the fragrance oil is good. So that could kind of eliminate not having a good fragrance oil for testing. Um, but now I would probably say the cashmere plum from Candle Science is probably one of yet. my all time. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. It's like, get that. that's all right now. Yeah. No, it's know, amazing. I, it's so I good. It's very, it's very their, unique. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just got their cotton iris and uh, it, like a sample bottle. Sorry, I think we're in a lag. So I think that's why I keep cutting you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. I keep doing the same thing. <laughs> I think the internet's catching up. Yeah. So I'm just flipping through the chat right now. If you see a question, we'll just jump in and we'll start answering people's questions. All right. Let's see. Let's see. I see one here. <clears throat> one of the first ones. That okay. So up I'm here. sure. Oh, go yeah. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> I was. Um, no, you go for it. <laughs> okay. Erica Salinas. Uh, why does the heat gun make my candle surfaces look worse? I would imagine you're probably using soy. If you're using like a 6006, the heat gun will make them nice and smooth. Uh, soy can definitely make them look worse sometimes just because of the way it hardens back up and it solidifies. And I know for me, certain oils and certain scents uh, will create that little kind of like pockmarked or kind of divoted surface. Is that something you've noticed? I, I noticed too. Yeah, well, I've noticed um, that with mine, if I don't heat it enough, then it creates more fragrance oil with it. It kind of creates more of like a shiny top. I don't yeah. know if you know what I'm talking about. When you use it, it kind of creates like a shiny top to it. Um, so that's what I notice the most about it. Unless I really sit there and I really melt like a good portion of it on the top layer. Um, but if I just try to heat it real fast, it's gonna just kind of make it look a little, little weird and shiny on top. Yeah, yeah definitely. Let's see. Oh gosh, so many questions. It's so hard to pick. <laughs> yeah, if you see one, just jump right out. So I think one of the things that I, th I find interesting to, to bring up and something that not a lot of new candle makers know um, is when you ask questions, it's really good to give as tell about what you're working with because if you say hey I'm using an eight ounce jar you know what wick would be best there's so many varying factors in it um, so I kind of find that interesting that that's something that you kind of learn as you get into candle making you learn kind of how to ask questions how to get the best advice and knowing that you know the wax and the diameter of the jar can make a whole world mm -hmm. of difference when it actually comes to wicking Absolutely. Like you said, there's a lot of different factors in there. So giving as much info as possible to get uh, so that somebody can go through and troubleshoot the best way. Exactly. So for instance, I have um, 
Bianca here, she asked, what wick would you recommend for an eight ounce, eight ounce tumbler jar using 464 soy wax? Um, I know you've worked with 464 more. I have learned from Candle Science that C recommended for 464. What is your experience with it? You said they recommend what? Uh, CD wicks. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I like the HDP and I like the CDs. Um, I've never been a huge fan of the Eco Wicks. I have had them work, uh, but the CD Wicks and the HTP Wicks, uh, I like to work with. Now, what wax do you use mostly? You're soy, right? And yeah, soy 10 is, has been the okay. wax that I've used with pretty much the beginning. It was the first wax that I really grabbed besides wax from Hobby Lobby. It was, oh, it was yeah. the next step up from that. Yeah. No, I've definitely done that. <laughs> I think I got my first wax from Amazon and just worked with whatever was there. I had no idea. Yep. yep. And, and so I totally get why people do that. Cause it's like, you just want to learn. So you're just going to get yeah. whatever wax is, you know, recommended or available to you. That's, you know, easy. You don't have to buy it in huge bulk quantities. Yeah. <laughs> so I totally exactly. get that. And Amazon is just a quick and easy spot for a lot of people to go to. I did get lucky with my oils because they do have a couple candle science oils on there. So I got lucky with those. Um, but yeah, because I've, I've tested oils from Michael's. They're very diluted. They're expensive. Yeah. Did you order, started, did you order candle science oils on Amazon? Yeah, they had uh, like four different ones. I think they had like a cinnamon, a lavender and a vanilla. And I think those are the only ones that they had on there, but they did have some. Wow. I'm not sure if somebody's really reselling lucky. them or what, but awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then of course, once they showed up, cause a lot of people just don't know to go to candle science. I mean, you type in candles or where to buy candle stuff. And I think Amazon and places like Hobby Lobby and, and Michael's, they pop up first. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very true. Let's see. Um, uh, somebody was asking about question, registering G? a company. Yeah. Somebody said, uh, would I need to register a company name with the county before opening an Etsy store website? Uh, thoughts on trademarking your name. If you're looking for any trademarking advice, I would definitely go to the Facebook, uh, the DIY candle group. I did an interview with Art Steele, who is a trademark lawyer or used to be a trademark lawyer. And she covers all that stuff. It, I was there, probably did a two hour interview, really good. She goes into detail about a lot of that stuff. Uh, as far as getting and registering your name, <clears throat> you don't have to register your name before you do an Etsy shop. Uh, it's a good idea to get your name kind of all wrapped up that way. Uh, and Art talks about this in there. You definitely don't want to get started with a brand name or a company name and then realize six months into it that somebody's already trademarked it and you've got to like redo everything. Yeah, no, that's definitely something to look into beforehand because I've even <laughs> seen people who they will go in and they'll create the logo and they'll create the, you know, all the stuff for the Instagram or whatever it is and realize that it's already taken. So yeah. it's just kind of a bummer when you realize that you put in all that work and you paid somebody to create the logo and it's not available. So that can definitely, definitely. be a bummer. Yeah, definitely a good idea to research as much as possible. Uh, that way you're just not caught down the road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I apologize again, I think it's just, I don't know if I'm choppy or if it's just kind of the internet connection right now, but it's a little laggy, so I apologize. <laughs> no, that's fine. Oh, somebody asked um, Miss Lovely Olivia pros and cons about the Presto Pot. That's an interesting question. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to think of some cons, but definitely pros is that you can make so many more candles at once. And something that I think that a lot of people get confused about about the Presto Pot is that you don't have to look at it like you're making 10 pounds of wax and pouring a bunch of fragrance oil into the Presto Pot. You're actually using the Presto Pot to melt down the wax as you would with a double boiler but then you're able to take it, a small amount of liquid wax into the pitcher and then put the fragrance oil into the pitcher. I know that a lot of people will think, oh my gosh, you're pouring all the fragrance oil. How do you clean it out? Um, I don't clean out mine. I just keep putting more wax in. I don't know about you. I just keep putting more wax in. That's exactly what I do. I just keep loading up more wax. I never put fragrance oil in it. I was going to say, yeah, huge. They're nothing but pros. Um, I've got like three of them sitting down here. I usually use two at a time. 
uh, I'm melting one while I'm filling with the other one. And then once that empties, I switch them. But yeah, you can roll through 40, 50, 60 candles in a day with no problem. Whereas using the double boiler uh, was, yeah, cleaning the pot out. You can usually only do six at a time. Uh, I'd say if you're going to look at a con, um, as the wax starts melting down uh, towards the bottom of it, the temperature goes up a lot more. So you definitely want to pay attention to your temperature because it can go from uh, 180 to 200, which isn't a huge deal. But as the wax, as you get less wax in there, it heats up really fast. Yeah, I was actually going to say that too. You have to be careful about the temperature. That can be a little bit of a hard thing to gauge sometimes when you're first starting out with them and you're getting used to it. Um, and then I guess the only other con I can think of is that it takes up more space. It takes definitely. up a lot more space than like doing like a small double boiler somewhere. Um, so you definitely have to think about that. I have three of them and I don't even have a place to put them. They're all over the place. So I just take them out when I need them. And then yeah. most of the time they just sit at the corner of my kitchen um but yeah you definitely yeah. have to think about space definitely. yeah definitely and you have to run them on two different breakers because if they're running on the same breaker they will blow the breaker <laughs> i've done that a few times somebody said this is a good one for both of us actually somebody said let me see if i can find it because i just scrolled past it uh because i want to say their name uh but they asked how did you guys both get comfortable filming videos? Um, you do it over and over again. <laughs> yeah, that's really about it. I know for me, uh, and Erica too, we've talked about this uh, years ago. I somewhat introverted, um, definitely comfortable at home in my own skin, uh, going out to public gatherings and anything like that. I will definitely kind of hang towards the back with people I know. Uh, I'm not running around the party and uh, introducing myself to everybody. <clears throat> and the good thing about doing videos is I'm literally here by myself. And for me, it was just pretty easy to jump on camera and you don't have anybody watching you. So it was, it, it was real easy for me. The hard part was putting that video out, knowing tens, hundreds, or thousands of people are going to see it. Yeah. And I think one of the hardest things, and you can kind of, you can kind of start being down on yourself because if you if you make a video and somebody points out hey you did this wrong in the video and you think to yourself i spent all that time making this video i tried to think of everything and then you miss something yeah. and i've done that before i don't know if you remember i did a video i did some calculations wrong in an old video this was like maybe eight nine months ago oh, and yeah. you would, you would point it out to me you're like hey this part of the calculations was wrong and I didn't want to have that video out there because once you put a video out there and you don't delete it, I mean, people will see it and think that, yeah. you know, most of the time people aren't looking at the dates of when it was posted. So people will take that video and, you know, learn from it. So I didn't want to have that out there. So sometimes it's more worth it to just redo the video and make sure you have good information out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. And yeah. And sometimes that can be hard too with, with start starting from the beginning. That's what I've, found out like learning and putting myself out there learning through the process I've mm -hmm. kind of looked back back at some of my videos and I'm like why did I why did I make like that just you know I didn't explain that right or I wish I could have explained it better but it was just kind of the process of me learning absolutely and uh, I've got the same thing I've got plenty of videos from two years ago where I just look at it and go ah I, I've kind of changed my opinion on that a little bit. It's still right, but I lean more towards this way, or there's some things that I did or said where it's like, yeah, I wish I could fix that. Or maybe even using some wicks where I'm doing like testing. And I say in the video, I'm doing testing. And that's what I try to do now. I phrase a lot of it. Like you said, you're showing your process. So <clears throat> unless I know something for definitive fact, I never say this is exactly what you need. I always say I'm testing this and testing this. Uh, just because they're, I got you got to leave that room for error if you just don't know. And I always try to put that in the videos. And there's a couple of times in the, uh, in the beginning videos where I don't say that, but I am testing and it'd be nice to throw up kind of like a, like VH1 pop-up video where it throws it up. <laughs> I'd like to be able to fix that post now. Yeah. I know. Right. I wish that YouTube allowed us to do that. I yeah. get why they don't, but I yeah. wish they did. So somebody's asking about cure times, uh, Catherine Malloy, uh, I've read a lot or 
I've read to let candles cure for several weeks, but a mad, but in a mad dash to get them out for the holidays, wanted to know the shortest cure time for making them. I'm not exactly sure what your thought is on cure times, but for me, I don't let my candles cure for more than three to four days, uh, three to five days, depending on the wax, coconut soy or soy. Um, I've done a lot of different testing and it is different for different people. Some people love to let them sit and they notice huge differences in two to three weeks. Uh, I've done testing at 24 hours, seven days and 14 days. And between the 14 or the seven day and the 14 day, I don't notice much of a difference. So I let mine cure for about three to five days. Yeah, I feel like that this is a huge topic, especially in the Facebook yeah. group. Um, a lot of people will say you have to wait the two weeks, but I, I feel like it really just depends on the wax that you're using. Now, are you referring to 6006 when you're when you're talking? About this? No, 6006. I'm at 48 hours and done. Okay. Yeah, see, that's kind of how I feel about soy tin. I honestly, I mean, I, I have no problem with making a candle and in two days shipping it out to somebody. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with it. Me too. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, and even with so, soy, a lot of people will say to wait, but uh, for my soy candles, I, I ship after three days. With 464? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I'm like, yeah I don't I've, wait I've, any longer than three to five. Sorry, say that again, you're cutting out. I'm sorry. I've never worked with 464 before, but yeah. I know that so many people will say that you have to wait two weeks. Yeah, and I've done a couple, I actually have a video in the Facebook group on that one where I made, I poured three different candles uh, at, from one pitcher, poured three, and I think I burned one at 24 hours, which was still way too soft. I got a little bit of a scent from it, but not much. And then I did one, I burned the second one at seven days, and then I burned the third one at 14 days. And the difference between that seven day and 14 day was like almost nothing. Yeah. I thought they I both mean, were right about I, the same. Yeah. I mean, that's a good thing to test. It really, really is to know. Although I know that when it comes to wick testing, I've heard that the longer you let the wax solidify and cure, it can change the way that the wick performs with the wax. Yeah, I definitely don't do any wick testing. Uh, I Again, I let those wait for about three to five days before I do wick testing because I want that wax like nice and solid. I definitely don't do it 24 hours or 48 hours for soy because it's still really soft. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, okay, so there's a question. Why do I have oil at the bottom of some candles when I use the right fragrance load? Uh, the only time I've ever seen that is usually people are putting way too much in, like their scale might be off and they could be weighing grams thinking it's ounces or they're going by volume or something. Uh, but if you have oil, like if you have oil, like a good quarter inch of oil down at the bottom, that's definitely just not good binding. So it didn't blend well when you stirred it or you might have added like three ounces when it barely holds two. That'd be the only reason for separation I could think I, of. I actually have been interested in, I've been interested in learning about that too, because I actually. You're cutting in and out. We we'll slowed down for a second. <laughs> haven't experienced that before, um, but my soil, the load of it, but it could be the. I'm trying to get you, you're cutting out pretty bad. Are you still there? Yeah. Um, Um, maybe not adding. Let me see. Be it in at a temperature where it's able to bind with the wax. Hold on a second. You were cutting in and out pretty bad.
you there? Are you there? <laughs> Hold on a second. See, we might have Erica log out and log back in just to make sure. All right, hold on one second. Okay, Eric is going to jump off real quick and then jump back in. So we'll wait a second. I've got the Q&A questions over here. Now we've got a couple questions lined up. When Erica jumps back in, I'll have her answer this one too. But Catherine Brooks was asking, how many sizes do you recommend people should carry? Um, for me, I like to, I like two different sizes. I would say if you're just starting out, to do uh, like an eight ounce and a 16 ounce offer two different sizes. The eight ounce is just an easy one to go for. It's a, it's a small enough candle to where people will buy a couple of them. Uh, it'll last a few days to a couple of weeks, depending on how people burn. And then having another bigger candle <clears throat> is a good option because you do have people that want that bigger candle that's gonna last for a month uh, or a bigger candle that will just fill like a bigger size room. Let me see if I can. Uh... Oh. <laughs> All right, Erica is frozen up a little bit, but she's coming back in. So we'll wait for her to come back in. So I'll just keep answering a couple questions. Uh, is there a better way to measure the wax in fragrance oil if someone is just bad at math? Uh, absolutely. I say, for one, getting a good scale is going to be a big thing. Uh, making sure that it's set to uh, ounces in weight or grams. Grams is an easy one. And then, of course, uh, <clears throat> even if you don't have a scale or anything like that, uh, in the inside of my metal pitchers, I took a metal file and I scratched the inside of it. Uh, so when I'm pouring like a 32, when I'm pouring 32 ounces, uh, and going into these jelly jars, I know that 32 ounces will fill six of these. So once I figure out exactly where that wax is, I fill it up and I made a scratch with the metal file. Uh, and now I don't need to weigh it anymore. I just fill the wax to that line and I know exact, I've got exact amounts. And you can do the same with uh, fragrance oils too. So if you have like, uh, like a shot glass that has, uh, line markings on it and you like weigh it out and you know where like one ounce or 1.2 ounces is, you can kind of fill it to that line almost every time. Here, I'm going to see if I can. All right, so Eric is going to jump back in here in a little bit. All right, so I think Eric is going to move over to the phone. Her computer isn't liking it. <laughs> All right, uh, Shanna G, what are the best waxes without paraffin to use for wax melts? Honestly, Soy 464 is a great wax to use for melts. I've got, um, 
some of these right here, just these little two ounce shot cups. Uh, this one right here is 6,006, but I've done 464 in these. 464 actually holds a lot of oil, so you can get a nice good scent throw from it. Uh, it's a little bit soft of a wax, so pouring it into things like this works out perfect because you can just squeeze these out, it dumps right in there, you're not worried about the shape. But if you're doing any type of uh, molds, uh, like little shapes and everything like that, it can get a little messy with those just because the wax is soft. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to jump over. <clears throat> Let me see. All right, so, okay, good. She disconnected, so she'll jump back in here in a second. I think she's trying to get in with her phone. Uh, accidentally ordered 4794 to mix with our wax melts. Can it be used with 6006? Uh, if so, what is the fragrance oil percentage? Uh, coming up with the fragrance oil percentage is a little tricky. I, I haven't used 4794, so I don't know how hard or soft that wax is, but you can definitely mix the two. And I would say if 4794 is a harder wax, you'd want to add less just because the 6006 is a softer wax. So you can definitely add a little bit of a harder wax, make those melts a little bit stiffer. <clears throat> and then I'm not sure what the fragrance oil uh, percentage is on that one or what the FO load is but 6,006 can hold uh, up to 10%. If that one is right around 10%, you should be good. But if it's a little bit lower, like if it holds like 8%, uh, I would mix the two and then add around 8%. Take the lower of those two and see how it looks. And then if it holds the 8% well, jump up to 9% and see what it looks like. Okay, we'll try to get her in here. All right, <laughs> try to get Erica back in here. Uh, Angie Samuel says, please speak about which wick to replace the HDP 83 that goes with the IGI 6006 wax and eight ounce jars. I don't have the new set of HDPs in, so I don't know exactly which one is going to work well, but as soon as they do come out, I'm going to get a bunch of those, do a lot of testing. But for now, I know you can switch over to the, uh, the CDs. The CDs work well with 6006. Uh, I believe the CD8 or CD10 would be a good one to try. Got oh, Wade's in here. All right, Wade, we'll be doing a, uh, a live with Wade real soon too. If you haven't checked out his channel, uh, Black Tie Barn Candle Co., he's in here. Definitely jump over, check out his channel, subscribe. And uh, the next time we do a live, it's going to be with him. All right, see, I'm trying to figure out some questions here. I'm trying to let Erica give her some time to jump back in here. There we go. Perfect. All right, her audio is connecting up. Perfect. Can you see me? Per I can see you perfect, hear you perfect. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't know. I'm like, I think it's just because my my computer is like six years old and oh. it just has a hard time <laughs> with everything. Oh my gosh, sorry, let me bring up the chat. I feel like I'm so sorry. No, that's perfect, oh. yeah. The video is nice and smooth. Oh my God, and I can hear you. It's like you would talk and then you would completely go silent for like 10 yeah. seconds and I'm like, and then I would interrupt you. Oh my God. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, on, on my side, you cut out for like a good three minutes. I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> oh, that was when my computer exploded yeah. pretty much. <laughs> okay, sorry guys. Let me bring up the chat. You're good. I just went through and answered a couple uh, couple questions. Thank you. Like oh, mixing waxes and. All right. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm here. I'm back. All right. <laughs> Oh, it's so nice to have an actual conversation and not like the <laughs> lag. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, oh, so I got, okay. Go yeah, for no, it. Go for it. Yeah. No, I was going to say, uh, I've got one right here. Hannah Goldstone. Uh, is there a trick uh, you guys recommend for better glass adhesion? I've tried pouring at lower temps and heating my vessels, but the wax still pulls away. Now, this is a great one that comes up with a lot of beginners and uh, I'll let you go ahead and answer. Oh gosh, and I don't even know if I have the right answer because I haven't noticed too much glass adhesion issues. I think the most is when I pour, I pour too cool, which is kind of funny. I notice if I pour cooler with my wax, I notice more glass adhesion issues and I've been pouring a little bit more warmer around like 170, 175. Okay. Um, but also the temperature in the room too. Mm -hmm. I notice if it's if it's colder, it has yeah. more issues and it has more issues. I get more of these weird, um, uh, by the wick, I get kind of that, like almost as if I kind of took the wick and I wiggled it a little bit, Yeah, if you know what yeah. I mean. So oh, that's yeah, kind of my experience with it. Yeah. For me, I stopped worrying about, I stopped worrying about glass adhesion really early on. Uh, once I realized it, there's really not much you can do about it. You can, you can do some stuff to kind of reduce them. And for anybody that's watching that doesn't know, the glass adhesion, when you're looking at a candle, it looks like a little air pocket kind of forms around there. And that's due to the wax shrinking as it cools. And as it cools, it contracts a little bit and then it just pops from the side of the glass. Uh, with certain waxes, you're just never going to avoid it. Uh, waxes like paraffins or 6006, something like that, where it has paraffin in it, it shrinks a little bit more, you're gonna always deal with them. So I always tell people, and it's hard for people who are in the beginning, they think they're doing something wrong and they want kind of that perfection. It's definitely something you have to get over with because even if you pour a candle and it's got perfect adhesion, right now it's getting cold. It was 30 degrees when I went out to my car this morning. The second you ship that in a UPS truck, uh, FedEx or anything like that, and it's cold inside that truck, that wax is gonna shrink even more and it's, it's gonna have a, a wet spot. Yeah, I feel like that's one of the things that we try to control, but science is going to control it more. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah. so it's it, it's those things that we we can control as much as we can with candle making and trying to make it safe. But with the way that it looks, sometimes science is just going to take over. It's going to do what it wants to do. And I, every time somebody's like, "How do I not have the wet spots? How do I not have the glass yeah. adhesion issues on the side?" You can try your best, but I wouldn't stress over it. I wouldn't make no. it like you see it having issues. You're not going to sell it. If you walk into any any candle uh, place that sells candles, Target, wherever that has candles, oh, look yeah. at the glass. More than likely, yeah. it's going to have those weird looks to them, the glass adhesion issues, and it's not a big deal. Exactly. And I tell people the same thing, especially beginners. I say walk into any store that sells candles and take a look at all of them and you're going to see wet spots in almost 90% of them. Yankee candle, every single one of them are going to have them. It's uh, yeah, like you said, it's science. It's just something that's going to happen. Uh, you can go to a non-see-through jar that definitely helps. <laughs> yeah, that's, hey, why do you think I got these? Exactly. Well, I, I like the way they look, but also yeah. I was thinking like, okay, so you don't have to see the glass adhesion sides on the issue, uh, yep. glass adhesion issues on the side. But I actually, when I first started making candles, I thought that was frosting. Oh, I thought yeah. that, that was frosting on the side. Um, oh, but yeah. then I learned it was just glass adhesion issues, which yep. frosting sometimes you can, it's all just little, little things of the candle that you just can't control sometimes. Yeah. And I guess if I was going to tell somebody something that you can do, it sounds like you're doing it right. Uh, you're heating up your jars, which I don't do because I just think it's time consuming and you're still going to get wet spots anyway. You can heat up your jars and you can pour your wax a little bit cooler so that it, ha it already has had time to kind of shrink down a little bit. And then with the combo of the lower temperature wax inside of a hot jar, it'll kind of melt and cool down with the jar as it cools. That can definitely help. But uh, even if you do that, like I said, you put those out into cold temperatures and it's still going to happen. Yep. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at what some people are saying. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um... I do.
did see somebody the other day talk about how they refrigerate their their candles. I've never done that. that. I've never done that because <laughs> I actually try to slow down the cooling process mm -hmm. of my candles. I don't like for them to cool really fast because I noticed that um, it gives a little bit more imperfections to the candles. Um, what's your no, crack too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you if you cool them down too quick or too cold, they'll crack, and you'll notice it a lot with beeswax because beeswax will crack anyway, just because it's such a hard wax. But even mm -hmm. with Sawyer six thousand six, uh, six thousand six, if you cool them in the fridge, you're going to notice the sinkholes in the middle a lot more. And then 464, you'll just see some cracking kind of go across because it, it cools so so fast and so cold that it starts to like pull in different areas and you'll just see a split usually across the wick. Yeah. And I've actually talked with somebody before who uses 464 and she heats up her jars. She puts it into uh, like a cardboard box yeah. and then she puts one of those like big plastic bags over it just to kind of keep the, the heat in to try to slow down the, the cooling process yeah. as much possible. And that's another good one. I, I've done that with 6006 just to kind of calm down some of the sinkholes with that one. So I'll put all 12 jars inside of the candle, or the candle science box that it comes in, and then I'll pour the wax inside the box. Mm -hmm. uh, that one works pretty well. It definitely gets rid of a lot of sinkholes with 6006. But for me, uh, you, you still have to go through, poke the, I use a chopstick, poke down through the middle of 6006 and use a heat gun anyway, because you will still get a couple small air pockets in the middle of those candles. And for me, I'd rather pour hot. Uh, this is a question that comes up in one of my videos, where is if you get less sinkholes pouring at a lower temperature, why don't you just always pour to low temp? And uh, for me, it's because you get some of those sinkholes and it will look like they're not there. But once you heat up the top of the candle, it instantly opens up and you can see that there was one there. So I like to pour 6006 hot. So it really exposes those sinkholes. And then you know exactly what you have to fill in. Yeah, no, that makes more sense. Um, also I, what was it? I had worked with the wax, just was trying it out. And the pour temp was, I think around like 120 and I pour it at like 170. It's usually like, I, yeah. I put, I take it from the, from my Presto pot. I put it into the pitcher, pour in the fragrance oil. I stir it for maybe, you know, 45 seconds or so. And then I pour it. I'm That's so what used I do to too. It as a fast process. And yeah. I, I just, I can't just let it sit there. Cause it takes a little while to get down to temperature. So yeah. So it just, I don't know if it just, I just want to keep moving. I just want to keep going. I, and also it just works. I'm the same way. It works better for me to pour it, to pour it hotter. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, do you, do you heat gun every candle or just if you see that it's having issues? We for 6006, I heat gun every single one. I just want to make sure that there's not a hidden sinkhole in there. So I'll, even if they look good, I'll take a chopstick and just run it right down through the middle just to make sure that nothing's hiding down below somewhere. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. And I know when I use the virgin coconut soy, it's one of the reasons I love that wax so much is it's a single pour. Uh, it, I, I've never had to do that with that one. Is that the one from the wooden wick? It is, yeah. There, yeah. I know there's another company that sells it, but that's where I get mine is from Wooden Wick. Yeah, I actually haven't tried that one, but I've been wanting to try it. I've been wanting to try more coconut <laughs> wax because if I ever have like a luxury line, I want it to be a coconut-based yeah. wax. Um, it's really so, nice. I like it a lot. It's yeah. uh, I've tried. I've tested all three of theirs. Their uh, the beeswax, which I'm not a fan of beeswax, but it it did handle nice. It's got kind of a sweet smell to it, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. uh, their cocoa apricot was really good but their coconut soy had the best hot throw, I thought, out of any of them. Best one? I yeah. definitely want to try that one. Um, we have a question. This is interesting from Tiffany. Uh, she says, how do you measure how to cut the wick? Um, I eyeball it. I don't know. What about you? I eyeball everything. Yeah, it's the yeah. same with sticking wicks. People are always asking how I like put the labels on or stick or the stick, uh, the wick in the middle. I eyeball everything. And I think it just comes with practice. A lot of things that you do just kind of comes with practice. Um, even, even seeing, I can pour a candle and look at the way that it uh, solidifies and the way that it looks and know I pour that a little bit too low or I yeah. pour, or I didn't put in the fragrance oil at a, you know, such and such temperature, or whatever it is. I can kind of know just by looking at it. And that's kind of goes for the same thing with cutting wicks. I'm like, this is right. You know, this is yeah. about right. It doesn't have to be perfect, <laughs> but it's about right of where I, where I need to be cutting it. That's an interesting question. Let's see. Oh, this is a great question. I'm, I'm curious to ask you this question. So yeah. um, uh, let me see from Tanisha. It says, if you guys have seasonal, seasonal scents in your candle line, how far in advance do you start testing? 
Uh, a lot of the oils that I use, um, I already know, uh, like the toasted pumpkin spice or pumpkin spice or whatever. I already, I use those every single year. Um, so I don't do any like testing going up to it, but if there's a new oil obviously coming out, uh, <clears throat> there's certain oils. Well, as soon as candle science releases them or nature's garden, uh, anything like that, I'll grab them and test them like immediately, but I'll mm -hmm. start testing to make sure they work probably a good month before the season comes out. It depends on how, how many candles you're making also. So, uh, I don't know, was it fall candles start hitting like right around September? So I'll usually get them in August sometime and make sure that the scent is good and I like it. That way I can order enough too, just in case oil supplies start to get a little low. Yes. And that is something that I'm learning because this is my first year in business. So I didn't know how soon in advance to order things, how much of each oil to order. Um, and I still feel like I'm not ordering enough of each of each fragrance oil and, you know, testing it. But I kind of learned that when the seasons are coming up that you do have to start thinking about it a couple months in advance of, yeah. especially, you know, I, I don't know what scents I'm using. I'm sure you've kind of used very similar scents, you know, throughout every year that comes up with the seasons, you're very familiar with them. Yeah. Um, but what I'm trying to test out everything and I'm sure everybody else is, you know, oh, yeah. who is just new in business too, kind of feels <laughs> the same way. So um, I will look forward to next year when I kind of have a little bit more of a better grasp on it, on when to start, you know, making things because I'm a procrastinator. So so, I usually, <laughs> so I usually just wait till the last minute for everything. Yeah. I, I'm still making can I'm launching my winter candle line tomorrow and I'm still making candles today. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I would definitely tell somebody, give yourself at least a month, if not two months to try stuff out and order stuff. Uh, I mentioned in the group for the last two years, lids are one of those things that goes out of stock almost every single Christmas. Uh, and right around like November, December, lids are hard to come by. So definitely order your stuff early. Uh, this year is a little bit different because everything is out of stock. <laughs> so and it it's hard to get jars. All year. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but yeah, normally I would say a good month or two in advance, make sure that you get, uh, even if you know what you're going to sell over by just a little bit, like get a couple extra cases of jars, definitely get some lids because they will be out of stock. Yeah, no, it seems like everything has gone so fast and it's really hard. And I know that a lot of people are frustrated with it. And like, we all understand, like we all understand, oh, yeah. like, the supplier issues that have happened because of what's been going on this year. So it's definitely been a struggle this year. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's see. Procrastinators unite. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that a lot That's of people right. are procrastinators. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I mean, I love to work and I love what I do, but I usually wait to like do it all at once and kind of, give myself a smaller time limit than I should. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it can, it can cause some issues sometimes. <laughs> you see, Georgie Williams asked, do you need lids for candles? Not necessary, right? No, definitely not. Uh, I know when I'm curing, when I do these candles right here, uh, as soon as they're hardened by the end of the day, trimmed, uh, I've fixed the sinkholes. I put a lid on them and just put them on the shelf. Whereas a candle like this, these don't have lids. So as soon as they're done, I just put them on the shelf and I'm done. So do you have dust covers for them or just no lids at all? No, I, I don't make two. Those are uh, the higher end line. So it, I may have like 10 on a shelf at any given time. So they're moving somewhat quick. Uh, yeah. If they were there for a while, I'd probably put something over the top of them just so that it doesn't settle. Yeah. But for the most part, I usually leave them out. Yeah. Cause a lot of people are curious, you know, do you have to have lids in order to cure your candles and you don't, um, the fragrance. I don't think so. No the fragrance isn't going to jump out of the candle just because yeah. you know, the lid's not off. The only difference that you might notice is that when a lid is on and you go to smell it, it's almost like throwing the scent at you yeah. versus when the candle doesn't have a lid on it and you go to smell it, it might seem like the cold throw is not as strong yeah. because it doesn't have it kind of compacted at the top right there. Exactly. It, it's almost like the fragrance oil on the top level of the wax kind of uh, evaporates just a little bit and it gets kind of, it gets lower over time. Yeah. And you know, one thing I've uh, noticed, I, I did have people mention this and I saw that people had talked about it was when you use scents that have a high uh, vanillin content in it mm -hmm. and you use tins, it can rust the tin and discolor the yeah. wax. Yeah, if you don't get a tin that's lined, it, they, they can definitely get ugly real quick. <laughs> yeah, I learned that. Definitely learned that. <laughs> Let's see. 
Uh, Tiffany Barnes asks, what is HTP 83? I see people talking about HTP is a brand of wick, uh, like a CD wick, an eco wick, hemp wicks, HTP wicks. It's just the type of wick that's out there. Mm -hmm. And then moving right into that one, Sophia George asks, so how do you ship without lids? Uh, for me, I'll take this candle, I'll wrap it in uh, tissue paper and just cover the top of it. And then I'll wrap it in bubble wrap, cover the top of it. And then uh, just pack it with packing peanuts. Yeah. Let's see. Um, what's the most cost-effective way to print labels? Um, I definitely think that printing them at home is going to be cheaper than getting them printed. Uh, mm -hmm. I looked into getting them printed and it definitely seemed like it was, it costs a lot more. Um, and I feel like a lot of people think that you have to get a really high end printer or a very, you know, expensive printer in order to print your labels from home, but you definitely don't need to, no. um, <laughs> you don't need to at all. I, I, the very beginning of my business, I was printing off of a $40 target Canon printer and it, was fine until it oh, yeah. stopped working, but it was fine for the print quality. Yeah, I've used uh, 30, 40, $50 ink jets and I used a $99 Canon laser black and white for probably a good three or four years and it worked perfect. You definitely have to find the right label for printing. Uh, that printer didn't work great for the, the clear labels. It, it printed fine on it, but it, they could have looked better. But yeah, yeah you yeah. can definitely make real nice labels at home with a $50 printer. And yeah. I get that question a lot, which is what printer do I go for? I work in IT, so I work with printers all day long. Uh, just like Erica said, you can get a $50 printer and it prints great. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people think that you have to spend a lot of money. I invested in a, in a more expensive printer just because I realized I was growing and I wanted it for my business. But you don't have to start that way. Just like I have a Dymo for shipping labels. You don't have to yeah. run out and go get one. You can just print it out on a regular <clears throat> printer with regular yep. paper, tape it to the box. It's not going to be a big deal. Yeah. Um, it just little by little, as you start growing, if you want to invest in more things that are going to make things faster, just like the Presto Pot, just like with other things, you know, I didn't start off with a Presto Pot. I was still making two candles at a time, you know, a couple months into my business. So oh, I did that for <laughs> like a long in, in a time. Double boiler. Yeah, I, I yeah. went with the double boiler for way longer than I should have. Yeah, and same. once I got to the Presto pot, I was like, why the hell didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> mm -hmm. So ridiculous. But oh, I was going to say for my printer, I did the same thing. I've got this one right here. Uh, I went a little overboard on this one just because I went with a color laser, which was good. But HP makes a $200 color laser and we have them at work. They, they're amazing. I've printed labels on them. This one was a little bit more and it's got other things on it because just with schoolwork and everything here, um, for the kids and everything. I wanted something that did a little bit more, but yeah, you definitely don't need to go four or $500 to get really nice labels. No, not at all. And I was going to say, like you said, with, uh, with sticker mule or something like that, I've definitely gone that way. The only time I would tell somebody to go towards sticker mule is when you know, you've got your label done. It's not changing anything like that. Then go out and spend the money on something. Cause you're going to be buying a thousand at a time to make it cost effective. Uh, so if you've got like this one right here, I mean, I do this one at home with a silhouette machine so I can do it. But if you knew you had your label just like clean done, like this one, you could probably get from Sticker Mule, order a thousand of them because that's not changing. But doing labels that have all the different scents on it, I mean, <laughs> get yeah, a thousand. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I tweak no. it too much. I change my, I'll, I'll play with the fonts. I'll change it around. I'm constantly changing up the scents and what notes I want to put on there. Oh yeah. I did not have it ordered because yeah. I know that I would order it and then just want to change it. So. Well, yeah. Knowing me, I would order it without net weight on it and I'd have a thousand labels with net weight, not on the candle. So but you yeah. would double check it like 400 times. Oh, yeah. like, okay, this is right. <laughs> and then get it ordered yeah. and be like, okay, it's wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yep. See if I scroll back a little bit and get some of these questions. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Oh gosh. Okay, so because you're using okay for the stamp for the one that says Stanley on it, is that matte black? Is that a matte black vessel? It is. Have you what is your experience? Because somebody had said, how do you remove fingerprints on black that. matte jars? I think it's impossible. I don't know what about you. I've had it's it's really tough. I will say these auras from Wooden Wick are pretty yeah. good. They really don't get too many too many fingerprints on them. But I have had other matte black jars that do that. I, I'd say 
I don't know, probably the thing with that one, you might be able to get a little bit of Windex and kind of take it along the sides. But yeah, getting fingerprints off of some of those matte jars is really tough. Once My you get those oils on there. I was just about to say the oils, it's whatever has oil on it. Sometimes I'll drip a little bit. If I get a little bit on the side of it, I'm like, oh, I know. God. I, I hate doing that because I yeah. have not found something that works to get it off. It, no, definitely not for wax too. Like you, like you said, you accidentally drip wax down the side and it, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's going to look like that. Yeah. It's awful. But I will say the oil or the auras from wooden wick are pretty good. I haven't noticed yeah. too much as far as fingerprints on that one. That's good to know. I definitely, cause mine are from California candle supply and they're pretty good, but sometimes I like you those. know, you can see, you know, some little marks on them or it doesn't bug me as much as it did in the beginning, because I know that if it's just a little bit, it's not something that I wouldn't sell. Yeah. Um, now I had a candle that I completely dripped down the entire side of it. I'm not going to sell that one. No. So it, re it really <laughs> just depends on what it looks like. Um, yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're picking up these with like wet Cheeto finger hands and they've got like red Cheeto dust all over them, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> oh, let's see. Okay, so uh, wait, no, go for it. <laughs> oh, I was going to say Jackie Hernandez asked, what advice would you give uh, first time candle makers? Just lit my first candle, bit disappointed trying to figure out where I went wrong. I uh, don't want to give up yet. Uh, I would say for first time candle makers, I gave this advice in the business class we did this morning. And it's the same thing I say for pretty much everyone. Uh, buying a kit is a great way to go. Um, there's a, a few good ones out there where you can get everything all in one, uh, the wicks, the jars, everything. So, you know, it should work properly. And then I would also say, if you buy your stuff separately, pick one jar and perfect it before you move on. One of the things I did early on was I went to Home Goods and bought like 10 different jars. And then I went to Amazon and I bought just one wick pack uh, that happened to be on there, which were terrible wicks, by the way. But I didn't realize at the time that one wick doesn't work for all jars. Uh, and so I went through, made 10 different candles, 10, 10 different sizes, and like one or two out of all 10 actually burned properly. And I just had no idea why. So definitely get one jar, uh, go to like Candle Science or uh, Wooden Wicks, their wick guides will tell you within a wick or two what should fit that diameter size and go with that and just keep testing that over and over until you nail it and then move on to other jars. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. And also, I think that what I see a lot, and I'm sure you see this too, is that people who have never made candles before, they've watched, you know, videos on YouTube, they've watched, uh, they've joined the Facebook group, they're getting all of this overload of information of what they should do. And then yeah. they almost don't know how to start because they want it to be perfect the first time. Yeah. And and they kind of get discouraged if the very first candle they make is not, you know, perfect or it has sinkholes or whatever the issue is. It doesn't have a good hot throw and it takes a lot of time to figure out what you like working with and what you, what works for you because something like I could tell Jeff exactly how I make my candles. He can make yeah. them and it could turn out differently. So exactly. you know, it, it changes. And I think that a lot, a lot of times people get discouraged because they have information overload and they don't know how to start. And then if it's not right, you know, my first candles that I made were not good, but I loved them. Because oh yeah, mine were terrible, was, the first ones. <laughs> yeah, it was the coolest thing ever because I hadn't even yeah. looked up any candle videos or anything before I made them. I just had fun. And, yeah. you know. Well, that's exactly. You got to have fun with it. You got to pick the right things and it definitely takes some testing. I use the analogy, uh, Gordon Ramsay could give you all the ingredients and the recipe to make the best dish in the world, but you can still burn it. Just because you have the recipe and all the ingredients doesn't mean it's going to come out perfect. You're still going to have to figure out how to get to that end, that end goal. Yep. Exactly. Let's see. Somebody said, what kind of shipping boxes do you use? For me, I get six by six by six boxes at Walmart and that's what I use. I don't have like, really? a, I, yeah, I don't have a go-to box yet. I put stickers on the side, but I have gone to uh, brandablebox.com. I've been looking at getting like branded boxes. So it actually looks a little bit nicer, but as far yeah. as like an actual candle box, I don't have anything yet. Oh, I don't have anything like that yet either. And I think that that's, that can be hard too, because when I was trying to figure out my cost of goods, 
I didn't incorporate shipping or shipping boxes or anything extra that I would have put into it. And I would like to have a nice actual candle box instead of the candle. Cause I just wrap it up in like tissue paper, get it in the box, yeah. you know, make sure it's protected, but it would be nice to get an actual candle box to put the candle in and make it look nicer. Yeah, I've definitely done that. I, I've gone out and looked at a few different places, getting some uh, like some laser cut foam. So the candles fit in there. That stuff gets real expensive real fast. And again, I haven't figured out the actual candle that I want to do that with yet, because uh, when you do figure out your box and like some foam inserts and stuff like that, you better make sure that that's the candle that you want to go with, because you're probably going to have to order a thousand of those to make it cost effective again, just like the labels or this. Yeah, the labels. Yep. Now, I know I had a 16, 17, they do the cut uh, where it's like the styrofoam, the styrofoam and it's completely molded to the shape of the jar. Oh yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. I thought it was yeah, so those cool. Are nice. Yeah. 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 I've reached out to a few companies to figure out pricing on that stuff and it, yeah. it jumps up quick. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's so expensive. Yeah. Um, and I use, somebody had mentioned it, but I use a uh, Uline for boxes. Oh so yeah. They're great. I, yeah, yeah. No, I, and I recently switched from the brown boxes to the white boxes and then I I'm like just going to, yeah, I'm just going to get a stamp made and stamp it right on the side. And I feel like that'll be a little bit more of an upgrade from what I was doing before. Yeah. And it, it, that's exactly what I need to do also. Cause I, I use a bunch of different boxes, but uh, I've been getting them from Walmart. Cause I think Uline, I can't remember what they come out to, but the, the Uline and the Walmart, I think it was like maybe a five or 10 cent difference. It wasn't a lot. Oh. So I've been using some of those, but uh, yeah, brandablebox.com is another nice one where you can get it printed on the side, the logo mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. And no, if you order enough of those, you can get it around the same price. Mm-hmm. Somebody said, what companies are helpful with creating and designing labels? Uh, I would say Fiverr is a pretty decent one. You'll have to do a little bit of research, finding some good designers with a lot of reviews. Uh, but if anything, I would jump into the DIY Facebook group. Uh, we've got quite a few designers in there that can give you some tips and, and help you out. I know there's a lot of people in there that uh, I don't know exactly what they charge, but there's a lot of people in the group that do labels. Yeah, you could either just search it like designer or graphic designer or logo or something in the search and people in the threads will mention that they're a designer or you could probably yeah. just post it and then people will jump on there like I can design it, you know, so you'll get people and I like to support people that are on like the Facebook group that yeah. are interested in candles and they're Definitely. also designers. So I, I yeah. That and if you don't want to reach out and pay for a label right away, I would definitely recommend uh, Canva. Uh, if anybody doesn't know, canva.com, canva.com, you can exactly. go there, you can pull up different labels uh, for the size that you're looking for. And they have templates that are already filled out that look really nice. And you can go in there and just double click the text, change the text. So, so it says your name or the fragrance name and anything like that. And that's, I've definitely done that in the beginning too. There's a lot yeah, of good looking templates that you can get some nice clean labels that way. Yeah. Canva is the best. It's become probably my favorite designing software. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, love I use it, it for too. every single one of my YouTube thumbnails now. I what do I use? Oh, I use um, Fonto. Have you heard of that? App oh, before? yeah, that's a great one, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use that one for my for my thumbnails. But Canva is great. Let's see. Somebody said, how do you get on the Facebook page? I'll grab the link and post it in the chat. I've had a lot of questions, or I see a lot of questions that are talking about marketing or promoting your candle business. A lot of people are asking about that. Um, you've been in business for a lot longer than me, so I'm sure you've you've kind of dove into more of marketing. I've, tr I've like, my goal for 2021 is to work on marketing. Um, uh -huh. Definitely. That's definitely a goal of mine. Um, but what's your experience with that? As far as marketing and just kind of putting yourself out there? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, just I think posting as much as possible. And uh, uh, like my Instagram, it finally hit 10,000. But I, I definitely don't do enough on my Instagram as much as I should. But the growth on there, uh, you can still get some organic growth on there. It's pretty good. Uh, just posting every single day is going to be the biggest thing uh, when you're doing your candles. Um, I like to think of it as like if you had a giant board and it had a million dots on it, like posting once is just like putting one single dot 
in a million dots and you're not really going to see it. But the more you post and you're posting all over the place, your dots, your candles will start to get recognized. And then, of course, jumping into other threads, commenting on people's posts. Like I go to uh, like lifestyle brands, home decor brands, um, and I'll post through there. Not anything like, hey, check out my page because people hate that. Yeah, but yeah, like no. real, yeah, <laughs> engaging in communities and stuff like that, jumping into uh, different Facebook groups, uh, just talking about uh, like home decor, anything that kind of fits in candles, but basically just, I mean, posting as much as possible. And uh, the more content that people see, they'll definitely start to pick up on. Yeah, no, and I think that's that's a good point because I feel like a lot of times people, and I bring this up a lot on my channel too, is I feel like a lot of times people forget that candles it's home decor. It's in the category yeah. of home decor. So when you're thinking about a target audience, a target market, you can think about what is the type of person that would want to buy my candles? What type of home decor would my candle fit best with? Um, so that's kind of a good way to look, a good way to look at that. Um, I've also heard about uh, getting started on Pinterest. So Pinterest is great. Yeah. So you're putting your candles on there. You're trying to get them onto boards where people yeah who are, you know, interested in purchasing certain kinds of home decor or whatever it is, um, can see, you know, physically see your candles, click on it, have it directed to your website. So it's kind of yeah, something that- Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and not to mention hashtags. Definitely don't forget about hashtags because I know for me personally, I do a lot of searches for hashtags and uh, just, I always try to include, I don't know, probably eight to 10 hashtags on a lot of my stuff. And I try to do at least half of them to where it's like the obvious ones, like candles, uh, where it has like uh, a high traffic amount. And then I try to do some off, uh, like some lower ones. So if you type in candles, there's probably like 20 million that will come up in the search. But if you do something like uh, candles at home, or uh, I'm trying to think of something else that's only gonna have like a couple hundred thousand, uh, your candles will get seen more in a search like that because there's not 20 million people posting in it. There's only a couple hundred thousand people posting in it, but hashtags will definitely get you seen a little bit better. Yes, no, absolutely. And I, I need to focus more on refining my hashtags and not just because I have a, I've in my note section, I've kind of where you copy I do the same thing. all your <laughs> hashtags, but I only have the same amount, like the same ones for all of my posts. And I need to, I need to make it a little bit more tailored to what the post is about. So for my holiday line that I'm going to be launching and the photos that I've been posting all, you know, Christmas candle, sugar cookie candle, whatever it is, it's going to be more related to what the post is going to be about. So yeah, kind of refining it for that. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, and with everything that's happening right now, TikTok is another one that still has real good organic growth. Uh, that's definitely an easy one to jump into. A lot of people are on it. Uh, you don't have to do dances with your candles. You can post whatever you want. Obviously, a lot of people just get kind of stuck thinking you have to do a certain thing there. But you can easily do videos where you're lighting your candles. That's a good one to jump into right now. And like I said, the biggest one with that one is the organic organic growth there is still very good. So you could post something on your candles and it will move to the front page and instantly be seen by a million people. Yep. No, that's true. And I keep telling myself to do it and I just don't do it. I told myself a while ago to start a TikTok. I've actually seen, there's this one girl who's actually done really well on TikTok and she's a candle maker. I forgot what her name is, but um, she does really, really well on it. Yeah, there's a few people in there that do really well. And that's the other thing is there's not a lot of people doing candle content on TikTok. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, that's an area where you could definitely like hit it big right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let me see, uh, Rebecca Earp asked, how would you, or how would you handle candle making in cold, uh, like a cement basement? I can't seem to get a good pour no matter what temperature I pour at. I've done ev everything from 105 to 135. I would pour hotter than that. Like Eric was saying earlier, uh, she and I both pour like right around like 170 and then just let it cool from there. The biggest thing you're going to run into with candles in a cold room like that is, is going to be the wet spots, but wet spots happen no matter what. So I would definitely say... <clears throat> Heat up the wax to 180, 185, add your oils, stir, and pour around like 170. Yeah, no, I'd recommend the same. Um, so I know you had made a video on this, and I kind of touched it and it touched on it in one of my videos, but it says, um, I see a lot of people making candles with essential oils. I was advised against it, but is it possible to do? So for me, it, I will say uh, most 
uh, fragrance oils that you get have essential oils in them. You can go to Candle Science's website. Uh, if you see any of the oil review videos that I do, uh, they all said uh, natural essential oils included in this, like cinnamon bark or something like that. They do have them in there. Um, if you're making a candle with 100% essential oils, I would definitely shy you away from that one just because uh, for the most part, essential oils just aren't made to be burned. They're meant to uh, be released with uh, like vapor or um, I forget the terminology for that one, but they're meant to be kind of thrown that diffused. way. They're not meant, yeah, diffuse. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they're not meant to be burned. So when you apply heat or flame to an essential oil, it does something different. Plus they're incredibly expensive. So if you're adding an ounce of essential oils to a candle, uh, your cost for that just went through the roof. And uh, yeah, they're just not meant to be burned. That's why you don't get a good hot throw from those. But essential oils can go into candles. They're in almost every fragrance oil that's out there. Yeah. And I think it's more of a safer, smaller amount into the fragrance oil yeah. and not just a hundred percent of the essential oil in there. Cause I feel like, cause I actually wanted to go that route. When I first started making candles, I wanted to do beeswax with essential oils, which oh, I'm yeah. sure so many people have looked into <laughs> doing. I'm sure so many people have looked into doing it. And I was like, I'd rather just, you know, use something that's properly made for candles and then be able to get the best candle that I can versus trying to go a different route, which could be actually worse, you know, with having essential oils in it. Um, but yeah, I agree. I don't think essential oils are made to be burned at all. No, no, they're just a, a kind of a nightmare all the way around. Yeah. <laughs> and they definitely help. They're in the fragrance oils because they help with the cold throw. You'll definitely smell them with the cold throw, but mm -hmm. once you light it, they're not going to be do much or they're not going to do much. And then I had a couple people ask, um, Miss Lovely Olivia, and then somebody else, uh, else ask what makes a luxury candle line or what goes into making a luxury candle line? Uh, branding, marketing. <laughs> exactly. It, it's, it's really going to be branding, marketing. Um, obviously, you could call this one a luxury candle, but most people are going to look in, they're going to look at that, and they're going to see eight others right next to it that look exactly the same and go, how is this luxury? Um, the look and feel of it. I uh, some of the big ones that you see out there, like uh, uh, Sire Trudon and uh, or is it Sear, Sear Trudon and uh, Diptyque, those are like the $200 candles that everybody knows of. Those are gigantic companies that already have like fragrance lines, perfumes and stuff like that. Uh, and they're putting their stuff into more like ceramic containers. Uh, although the, the Diptyque ones are just in a basic tumbler with a, a, like a sticker label. Um, but yeah, they probably have uh, their own custom fragrances. They're not doing too much different, but it's a lot of branding and marketing. And uh, they're just literally putting out, I mean, I guarantee the dip deep candles don't cost more than five bucks to make. Yeah, I mean, and of course you wanna make sure that you you, you are using quality, as, as nice of quality um, supplies that you can get, obviously Definitely. you don't want you know, try to find as cheap as possible and then just <laughs> call it a luxury candle. I mean, I'm sure some people would be able to do that depending on um, marketing, but I also think the label, the way that it's kind of the aesthetic of it and the way that yeah. you brand it can really change the way that people are, are viewing a candle. And that kind of goes into perceived value. So exactly. the way that it's perceived to the customer can make a huge difference. So exactly. I was yeah. just going to say the same thing. The perception of what you're giving them is going to, is going to mean something. So like looking at boxes, you can go out and get one of those foldable boxes from uh, like papermart.com. They're like a buck a piece, but they look like they're a buck a piece. And if you go look at a box, like a diptyque box, they're solid construction, they're thicker boxes. They just look like they command a higher price. And then you look at their labels there, you can tell they're professionally done. So it's definitely the look and feel of a lot of that stuff. Some of the comment cards and everything that comes inside those, they're beautifully printed. Uh, they're embossed. I mean, they look like a hundred dollar candle. Yeah. And that's another thing is if you are doing a luxury line and that's kind of why I've shied away from it. And I know you're kind of working on that as well, right? With yours. Yeah. Trying to, trying to come up with something. Yeah. And you have to think about when you are shipping it out, you need to think about the way that it's being perceived, like the way that it's getting to the customer. You want to make sure that it's very nice. You're not going to just throw it at any box, throw yeah. some, you know, packing peanuts and some bubble wrap in there and toss it in there. It needs to be a presentation because they're yeah. paying the money for that. Definitely. 
It's like yeah. when you open an Apple product, like, you know, you're opening something special. Everything yeah. is just beautifully laid out. And if you bought that same laptop and it came with like straw from a field, like kind of wrapped around it and it was wrapped in a burlap sack, you'd be like, what the hell? Like yeah. I just paid $2,000 for this. Yep. Let's see. Oh, how long can I store an open bottle of fragrance? So I had learned um, that a fragrance will, I don't know if it goes bad or if it's just not as strong after a year. Is that your kind of? That's, yeah, I was going to say that's typically what I've heard from a few different people. Um, I've definitely had a couple like sample bottles that have been sitting around for a while and I've used them and they've been just fine. But I would say try to get it. Uh, yeah, try to use them within a year. Yeah. And I've never done any personal testing past that, like right at a year, but that's what I've heard from several people. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, okay. So somebody, somebody had said 170 degrees is not too hot to add in the oils. Will it not burn the oils? Um, no, I feel like this is a common misconception of candle making because a lot of times people will look at the flash point of the bottle and think that they can't add it in, or if they add it in at over a certain temperature, then it's going to burn the fragrance oils off. Um, I add all of mine at 185 and it's hot enough. So it's, it's binding with the wax. Um, but it doesn't burn the fragrance oil. It doesn't burn it off or anything. I don't notice it. I don't notice any poor hot throw or cold throw on my end when I'm doing that. I actually notice that it's better than when I add it in at a lower temperature. Yeah, it's going to be very minimal for burn off. And I've got a video. Uh, it's a test video where I do like a low temp method and I try to add it as low as possible. Um, it, it's not a video. It's not a method that I recommend for definitely not for beginners. And it's, uh, it's definitely something I wouldn't recommend testing. It's not a preferred method. It's not a manufacturer suggested method. It's uh, just a video I did just to see how it would work and how the difference was. Um, it does work. Uh, you get a good hot throw from it, but I get a good hot throw from adding at 175. And uh, I talked to the guys from Candle Science and they were talking to me about adding oils hot and everything like that and getting burn off. And directly, they did a test. They heated up their wax to 180 for a solid hour and then poured the candles. And they said they noticed like less than a percent uh, of a difference between the, the burn off. So even if you pour the oils at like 175, uh, 185, you're not going to lose that much oil. Mm -mm. Somebody said some sinkholes are craters. Yes, they are. <laughs> Especially <Yeah. laughs> <all six. laughs> Somebody said, does the uh, FO percentage, the fragrance oil percentage affect the hot throw? Uh, yes, definitely. The wick is going to play a bigger part of that, but I don't know if you've done any testing with this one, but I've done some testing. Oh, somebody said I cut out. Uh, a little so, bit. I thought it was me. I, I had okay. like a flashback. <laughs> All right. I think sometimes when I'm too close to the mic, it does it sometimes. Uh, yeah, the, the fragrance oil percentage that you add can definitely play a difference. I know every time I've made a candle with 12%, it almost seems like it's too much oil and the wick and the wax burning together and melting together doesn't know what to do and it can't pull up enough or it's pulling up too much oil and it just doesn't throw it from the flame. So I know for me, when I go down to eight and 9%, I get a much better burn and a much better hot throw. Yeah, and I find that really interesting because I feel like a lot of times when people aren't getting a good hot throw, they think, well, I just need to do a higher a higher load. And it, yeah. could, it could mean that you need to change your wick completely because it's not throwing very well. The wick plays such more of a role than just yeah. the melt pool. And I feel like a lot of times people like what's really hard is that it's a variable. It's a very variable type of experiment that you're doing. So there's so many different factors in. So sometimes if you change one thing up um, or if you change two things up at the same time, it can kind of throw things off. And that's why it can take a long time with testing because you want to keep as many things the same and only change one thing at a time. And it can be, it can be very, very time consuming. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> very time consuming. <laughs> So somebody brought up, uh, somebody mentioned using packing peanuts and bubble wrap, uh, kind of being bad for the environment. Why not move to more eco-friendly packaging? Uh, yeah, there are definitely some, some better alternatives out there. I know there's a lot of, uh, Wooden Wick actually uses quite a bit of them. I don't know exactly what it's called and I don't have anything here to show you, uh, but you can get kind of sustainable or renewable, not renewable, but <laughs> you can get sustainable uh, packing peanuts. Uh, I, I can't remember what they're called, but uh, you put water onto them and they dissolve. So you can definitely get some stuff. Are they made of cornstarch? Is that what they're made of? Yeah, I think it's made of cornstarch okay. and they just completely dissolve. Yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah. definitely some good stuff out there. So if you want to be a little bit more eco-friendly, uh, which I think everybody should definitely could kind of pay attention to, there are definitely some alternatives. Um, I know I used a lot of crinkled up paper, stuff like that, something that can be kind of reused and wooden wick actually has, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's, uh, yeah, biodegradable bubble wrap. There's some stuff like that where it's, uh, it, I don't know, just like a bunch of cardboard with a bunch of slits in it and it packages up real nice and kind of bunches up. That's really good stuff. I know what you're talking about, but I don't know the name for it. And yeah, I've I don't know what it people, is either. <laughs> I've seen people use that. It's like a weird crinkle cut type of paper. Almost like an accordion style. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what it looks like. Yeah, no, there's definitely, there's definitely better ways. And I've, I've definitely tried to do that as well because I was using tons of bubble wrap because of course, when you're first getting started, the last thing I want is to worry about if my candles are going to arrive broken. I'm already worried yeah. about if my candle is okay, if it's going to be a good candle. And the last thing I want to think about was if it was going to break. But now that I'm more comfortable with shipping candles and, and breakable things, I'm definitely looking more into moving away from that and trying to do more um, more, uh, eco-friendly type of yeah. packaging. Yeah. A little bit more environmentally conscious stuff. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, do you mix your fragrances to make a custom scent or just rename supplier scents? I do both. Um, there's a couple, I do real basic mixing. So something like, like I said, cinnamon is one of my favorite ones. So I'll do, uh, uh, like a vanilla cinnamon. I mean, it do so, stuff like that, like a lavender and a vanilla driftwood and a vanilla. I'll do some stuff like that. Uh, but certain oils just don't need it because they already smell so nice. And like oils from wooden wick are a little bit more complex in their makeup. So adding something to that can really throw it off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. But the, the ones I mix are like the real basic ones, like a straight cinnamon, straight lavender driftwood, something that doesn't have like a pre-mix in. Yeah. And I feel like I feel like, I don't know about you, but when I go to make a candle and if I know that it's more complicated to make in terms of blending the oils for some reason, I'm like, gosh, why am I blending so many oils together? I usually just yeah. try to do two and that's yeah. about it. Even if they're their own blend together, I'll just try to mix the two of them together. And I know another question is, well, how do you know how much to use of each? It's preference. If you're looking at something yeah. like, for instance, for your cinnamon and vanilla, if you want just a little bit of cinnamon, you'd probably maybe do 75% yeah. uh, vanilla, 25% cinnamon or vice versa. And there's really no right or wrong with that. No, definitely not. And I would say the more that you get used to certain oils, you'll know which ones will stand out more. Like cinnamon from Candle Science is really strong. So if you're going to mix a little, like if you just wanted a hint of cinnamon, that one is so strong, you know that you only need to add a little bit. So like you just said, 75 and 25. So I would add like 25% cinnamon on top of a whatever vanilla so that I just had like that hint of cinnamon in there. Mm -hmm. And that's something you just get more comfortable with as time goes on. Yeah, and it's fun. It's, it's kind of one of the more fun parts of it. And I feel like that kind of goes into a lot of people are worried about wasting supplies or wasting product in order to, to do that. And I have done to where you take, I have like the little fragrance uh, strips, almost like the perfume strips. And I'll put it, oh, into yeah. the, I'll put it, I'll put them into the oils. I'll put them into one of my tins and I'll close it in. And then I'll just kind of smell it a little bit later on. And it kind of <laughs> gives you an idea of what it's going to smell like, but you really learn what it's going to do when it, when they're blended together into the wax. Yeah but you get an idea of it if you do it that way. But I don't know, Definitely. I think it's fun. Even if it doesn't turn out, you know, you're yeah. trying to find something. <laughs> 
Well, plus you just never know uh, like what's going to blend well, what's going to, yeah, you just never know adding just one thing could really change the kind of the whole spectrum of what you, what you get. Another thing I like to do is uh, every time I go to, I don't know if you go to like TJ Maxx or something like that, they have like a bunch of different candles that they're getting rid of. I'll mm-hmm. go through and smell a lot of those different ones. And usually they have like what's on the side of them. And I found a couple candles because I've gotten uh, the sample bottles of vetiver for a while, but I never know what to use with it. And I don't think it really smells that great on its own, but I was walking through, uh, I, I think it was like TJ Maxx or something and saw a candle that had like three different scents on it and it had vetiver in it. And I picked it up and it smelled amazing. And you could definitely pick up the vetiver. And I was like, I was like, okay, that's perfect. And I think I I tried to go back home and kind of replicate it a little bit, but yeah, Yeah. that's another one I'll go through and just check mixes. Yeah. I think I had tried, it was a lavender. I didn't know how to pronounce that word. I just, it was a lavender vetiver and I got it and I was like, this is terrible, but it had great reviews. (laughs) I didn't, I didn't like it, but I know that it's different for everybody. Like um, I have a fireside I'm working with from candle science. I hate it. Yeah. But but I know so many people like that really like smoky type of scent (laughs) and I'm blending it with more of like a pine scent and it actually came out really good. So you never know. The, the candles that I posted, I I just did, uh, and I'm well halfway done with a hundred candles for somebody and I'm mixing four different oils for them. And like 10% of it is fireside. And it's again, I hate it on its own, but adding a little bit of fireside to like a toasted marshmallow smells really good. Really and it's good. just a hint of fireside. Yep. Yeah. I made the mistake of trying to do a 50, 50 fireside with Fraser fur. <laughs> nope. Nope. Didn't work. I made the, I made the mistake of doing a hundred percent whiskey. Oh, it's such an awful smell anyway. And I made a can because somebody wanted a candle for it. And I said, it's really strong. And she's like, I, I love the smell. Go ahead and make me one. And she lit it for about 10 minutes. And she's like, I'm out. Yeah, I can't do that. It's so strong. <laughs> so strong. Oh, yeah. no, I could not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people are throwing out like what to mix with what. Yeah, there's so many combinations. I had actually learned because candle science threw out um, like what to blend together. And it really helped me with trying to find some blends for my winter line. Because mm-hmm. you never know, you could take two blends, blend them together in a certain way, and it could create a whole new scent. Yeah. And I really love doing that. Yeah, I was going to, I'll reemphasize, just walk into places. And it, like I said, TJ Maxx is the best place because they usually have so many, or Home Goods is another one, because they'll have like 30 different candle brands. So you get a real good mix. And I'll just go through and start smelling different ones and see exactly what they're mixing. And I'm like, okay, I would have never thought about that combo, but that smells really good. Yeah. That's probably the best way. Yep. I mean, you got to go with what works. So if you look at I mean, I mean, I know people's, I know people in the group that still buy, you know, Bath and Body Works candles just because oh, yeah. they know what works and they know the scent <laughs> combinations that work and you can get ideas from it. Yeah. So you grab a couple more and then head out. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I, it was weird. I saw a couple more questions about YouTube. Like about making YouTube videos. Oh, was there? I missed all those. Yeah, if there's something in there. So this person said, where was it? Oh, do you have any advice for making a YouTube channel making candles? So, because you had jumped out. How long have you been on YouTube, actually? Uh, since 20, well, for the candle channel, since 2016, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it was like July 2016 is when I made the first video. Yeah. And uh, obviously things have kind of changed a little bit. There's more, more of the community. I'm sure that it was very oh. small when I first got started. Yeah, for candles, there was hardly anything. Like I said, when I first got on there, I know Candle Science has a video that's 10 years old that's been on there. I never mm-hmm. saw that video when I first started searching candles. Uh, I found probably two videos and there was one that I watched three or four times. And that's the one that kind of, it had the most information, I guess, at the time that I could see. But even in the video, uh, and I hate to call her out, but even in the video, she said, I'm not going to give you the exact amounts that I'm using. Cause I don't want you to cut into my, in, cause I sell candles and I don't want you to cut into my profit. And I was like, all right, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of weird. <laughs> You're like, okay. Especially, yeah. So I, I feel- was like, all right. But that video is what made me want to like, I saw the gap in the lack of content that was out there. Or I, for me, I was just like, what, 
that video is good, but it could say a lot more. There's so much more to know about candles. And that's why I created that first how to make candles video is because I just, I thought what I can do a video that gives a little bit more information than that. But yeah, I would say just get out there, start doing it. I mean, just put your, and like somebody said earlier, how do you get comfortable? You just get comfortable by practice, just putting it out there and doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be weird. You're going to hate the sound of your voice. You're going to hate looking at yourself when you're editing. Like there's so much that goes into it, but the more that you just start, and I've seen so many more people getting started with candle making videos and it's so cool. It's so cool. I love it. And it's really interesting because you can see everybody's taken, everybody's unique and what you're doing is going to be different than somebody else. And they could, you know, like for instance, like Tiana, Tiana Coates, she's, oh yeah, she's great. She's completely different from me. She's completely different yeah. from Jeff, like with what we're making with our candles. And we're all very different in what we're doing. So absolutely, kind of, it's cool to have the variety of-, of Oh, absolutely. And like we were talking about earlier, people learn different things. Like, like you, me, Wade, Tiana, we could all say the same thing, but people are going to hear it very differently. So that's why I always say, yeah, just get out there and do it. And I mean, anybody watching anybody's videos- Like, even when I see my videos, I'm like, okay, I could have done that better right there. Or I should have said this or added this. Like, that's where people get the idea for content and getting in there and just saying, I'm going to make a video, but I'm going to do it this way because it helps me learn better. Or I think people would pick up on this uh, where I think that they missed or something. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times when people are worried about starting a channel beyond just being nervous about actually being on camera is that they might think, and I thought this way too, I I remember thinking, I don't know what videos to make. Mm -hmm. And I don't know really, you know, and now there's so many video topic ideas. I mean, (laughs) from when you're part of the community and you see what people are struggling with, those are your video ideas. You know, the questions that people ask. You know, we could have made probably a whole video on all the questions we talked about today. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, there's just- Yeah, there's so so much out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I will say, uh, if you're looking at a channel, um, I can go, I'm going to have to do a video on my metrics and like growing the channel and everything like that. Cause I made videos for probably a year and a half and hardly anybody watched them. I mean, they started to gain traction and then there was a point at like a year and a half in where it caught and then the growth started to grow. So, I mean, if you don't mind making videos for absolutely nobody for a year and you can, kind of keep pushing out and keep doing that. And I definitely didn't make enough videos in the first year that I should have been making. Um, But I mean, I I know that now and you don't know unless you do it. Like once you start to do stuff, you start to see the gaps and you start to see like what you messed up on, but that's, you know what you need to fix for the next one. So yeah, just putting your stuff out there. Yeah, no. And it teaches you a lot too. It teaches you about even if you're like, for instance, a lot of times people think, okay, I'm working so hard on my candles and nobody's buying them. Mm-hmm. You work so hard on your videos, nobody's watching them. Yeah. You know, it kind of, it kind of goes hand in hand and you learn to just keep going and know that you will grow and know that you'll make sales if you just keep going. So yeah, absolutely. Kinda, kinda exactly. Let's see. Okay. Um, do you want to do maybe one more one? Sure. Um, and then i know it should save i'm I'm doing this live on youtube and it should be recording so if you guys miss this one it's going to be i'm going to download the video send it to erica as well and we're both going to post it so that people can go back through and rewatch this also yes it's not recording in Zoom, so I'm really hoping YouTube saves that live. <laughs> oh, okay, so well, okay, so this one will probably be more for you because you've actually been to farmers markets before. But they said, how many different size jars would you recommend starting out when you go to farmers markets? Uh, I kind of answered this when you uh, were jumping over to your phone. Um, it. It, well, it was similar, but it was, it was okay. talking about how many candle uh, sizes should you have in your lineup. And I always recommend having two, like a 16 ounce and an eight ounce. I think those are two good sizes. You give people some options. The eight ounce is kind of a go-to for everybody. You're going to sell those like crazy. They're going to buy two or three or four because they're smaller. They burn quick. Uh, And then having a little bit bigger one is kind of nice because some people want a candle that's going to last for a couple months and a a bigger candle. So it fills like an entire room rather than just like a small bedroom or something like that. Um, And then just having a little bit of variety 
Uh, I mean, obviously people can go with three or four different sizes, but I think having at least two at a farmer's market is pretty good because it just gives people more, uh, more of a, a variety to choose from. Did you, when you first went to a farmer's market, did you, what, what was your experience with it? I was, well, the first ones I went to, I started to go to anything I could pick up, which were like weird church bazaars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was 25 bucks to sign up for one of them. I think I made 25 bucks at the yeah. thing. <laughs> I, but going to the first farmer's market was really good. Uh, they're a lot of fun. Uh, I didn't know how many candles to take. So I just took everything in my inventory, which is probably 50 or 60 candles at the time. And I uh, just kind of hung out with, uh, with my kids at the time, just selling candles. But like I said, with kind of repeat uh, trial and error, stuff like that, you don't know exactly what to do at your first car farmer's market. But when you're there, like the whole time I was there, I was like, okay, I need this scent. I need this. I need a cash drawer. Like you just, when you do it, you start to go, okay, I'm missing this. I need to get this for next time. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of my, my fear when it comes to going to a farmer's market is I'm trying, not that I'm like set up for one or anything because of obvious, but yeah. Um, when, when the time comes that I want to do it because I do want to, I think in my head, how do I take them there? How do I, what do I put them in to, to take all yeah. the candles there? And there's so many things that go on in my head of like, how do I get, how do I make sure that I have everything that I need to? Oh yeah. When I did my first one, I didn't have tablecloths. I just, I put them on just, I mean, everything was so bad, but you just, yeah. you don't know. I mean, yeah. and you show up and you see a hundred other booths who've been doing this for 10, 15, 20 years sometimes, and they've got professional setups. They've got tablecloths with their names printed on it. They've got big giant banners. And I'm over here with like two card tables and it's just like, all right. This... <laughs> and they're like, well, we know that he's new at this. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you've got to start somewhere. And that yeah, really absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. I'm going to send you over the video and uh, we'll definitely have to do this again. Yeah, definitely on my phone. Cause my computer cannot tolerate yeah. <laughs> the connection apparently. So for All my right. channel, where can people find you? Uh, Memory box candle co um, on YouTube and Instagram. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. You have an Etsy page too, right? Yes. On Etsy as well. Same, same name. Same for me, Stanley Handcrafted, everything. Look, the website, the, the channel, everything. All right. Well, thank All you guys right. for, for showing up and answering or asking questions. Yeah, thank you very much. And I know we didn't get a lot of these. That's why we'll definitely come back and do this again. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to try to go through. I'm hoping these comments stay here. So I'm going to try to go back through uh, when the, the video gets posted to the channel and kind of answer a lot of these as well. Yeah, no, that's actually a good idea.